and then we will get underway with your presentation on our machines ready to take your job. So Rajiv Srivastava is the founder of Big Data Trunk, a big data training and consulting firm with offices in the United States. Uh, Raju has had the fortune of working in the data and analytics space for over two decades. Having worked with corporate small, mid, and large sides around the world, Raju brings his passion for data and education for clients. He loves to share with the world through conferences and meetup groups. Uh, Raju has authored books with top U.S. publishers, including uh, books on SQL Server 2016, High Availability Unleashed, and another one for Microsoft Press. So I'm going to pass things over to Raju for your presentation. Yeah, so Tong, can you hear me clearly and yeah. see my presentation? Okay, and do you want to, uh, I see a couple of minutes still left. Do we get started or wait for 11.30 to exactly happen? Oh, well, we can uh, get started now because the uh, more time we have, the better, and then we can also make up more time for the Q&A at the end, if you like. Absolutely, okay. So thanks everyone for joining for this session, Our Machines Ready to Take Your Job. So I have broken this session into two parts. We are primarily going to have two things covered in this 30 minutes conversation and 10 minutes of Q&A that what have machines started to, what portions of the world have machines started to take our jobs already and how intrusive they are. And not only that, I want to focus more on the conversation about how and what can we do about it. So it's not about gloom and doom and what we can really address to take the tide on our side of the world. So. Let me get started. Um, before we get go deep into what machines have really done, let's understand how machines really work and what they functions. And one of the common things people think is their programming has been a case where software Silicon Valley, software industry has been flourishing for decades now. And that's kind of machine learning many people think, but I want to break that myth and make people understand in a very simple example, how that is quite different and do a quick comparison between programming and machine learning. Um, so that people get a sense like the, how the mindset has shifted. Most of the people have done some programming in some soft, sort of the other, some language. In a programming world, traditional programming, we have a computer, a machine, a computing device. We have some input data. I've taken a very simple use case of just one, two, three, four. A programmer has been asked very specific prescribed rule. They have to achieve certain program. Let's say a very simple program in this case is how to find the square of a number. So each number has to be taken and square. If everything works fine, no errors, nothing, this is the, going to be the output. One would change to one, two would change to four, and so and so forth. That's been programming and a very set rules and prescribed set of uh, instructions which the programmer is giving for the computers to perform. Now, how is that different? And isn't that sort of machine learning? No, it's not. In the machine learning world or data science world, we start with the similar thing. We need a machine, a computing device. We of course have input data and I just kept one, two, three, four, it's just to have apples to apples comparison. But here is where the difference starts. Instead of providing a set rules or a prescription, what the machine has to do, we provide actually some examples or output for those scenarios. And here is a simple scenario which I have done. You may want to take a few moments to think about what's going on. If you look at the input and the corresponding output, one changes to one, not much can be inferred there, two changes to eight, three changes to 27. And I'm sure many of you have already figured it out by now that this pattern is what is cube. So we human beings can take a look at that and analyze and very quickly come to an answer it's a pattern of y is equal to cube of x. Uh, that's very straightforward for us if and only if there is only few number of data sets and the formula is simple. But as soon as it starts become millions of records and the pattern is not as straightforward as the cube or a simple formula, we human beings back out very quickly. And that's where the machines thrive. And they learn through this pattern and they can get to very complicated systems and answers which cannot be done in the traditional world of just doing rule-based programming. You cannot define a rule-based system to beat a chess game. There are thousands and thousands of iterations and combinations, but you could, as you know, very clearly this can be done by a computer and it has beaten the champions of the champions of the world. Uh, not something which can be done by writing a simple program. It's not easy to find through images and say, this image is a cat or a dog. This image has 
a disease or not a disease and so on and so forth. Not a rule which you can write very straightforward. There are so many exceptions and challenges, but it can be done by giving examples and enough number of examples. The key is having a lot of data. So hopefully this clarifies the difference between programming and how machine learning world is changing the overall landscape and how even challenging problems can be solved by machine in a very systematic way. So I wanted to start with that so that everybody understands this and understands a very simple example and get the mindset how machine learning is changing the world unlike what programming did. Now this is not something which has just started now. It's been going on for quite some time and those examples can be taken in this case, five would become 125 and so on and so forth. This is not new. This has been going on for a while. And if I, if I were to ask questions to people, if you wanted to type in the chat, you could do that. When was machine learning or this AI revolution started? Without interest of time, I'm going to move forward and give out the answer. It's almost 1950s, quite some time. It's not something which has happened just recently. Interesting enough, the first neural network, 1951, nearest neighbor algorithm, 1967. So as you see, all these shiny algorithms and the buzzwords which are happening right now, it's not something which has happened in the last decade. They have happened 50 years plus. So why, as human beings, if we have tamed statistics, we have got these algorithms, why we were not able to get those machines working all around us in such a successful way? There are quite a few reasons. Actually, that was considered to be the first AI winter in 1974, but all this buzz and excitement subsided because of two main things. One, we did not have enough number of data sets to be able to do what we wanted to do and the compute power. I even go ahead and say that in 1960 or 1970, if somebody wanted to create an Alexa kind of application, they could have done it. It's technically feasible. The only challenge is the user experience. And this would have been the user experience. Somebody in 1970 created that device would ask a question to Alexa, what's the weather today? It would spin and spin and spin for a month and probably still give you a wrong answer. And that's what you don't want. User experience is the key. And that's the difference which led to the AI winter. It doesn't mean that everything stopped at that point of time. The progress definitely stopped. The investment in this field stopped and reduced to drastic extents. But people kept on making changes. At Stanford itself, there was a Stanford cart to navigate in a room and not hit obstacles in 1979. Uh, very publicized, 1996, Gary Kostro uh, was defeated by IBM Deep Blue. That was a big feat by itself. Um, and things, things keep on continuing to build. 2006, deep learning was coined. It's not something which happened last couple of years, which as many people think so correctly. Now, what I think in the last couple of years, why the buzz has happened, it's the third AI revolution which we have, the wave, third wave which is happening. But I think these are important things. The data set which we have got for the last 10, 13 years due to big data revolutions, Hadoop and MapReduce and Spark and all those changes have provided us an ample amount of data. And the GPUs and different kind of cloud computing and capabilities had given us an enormous amount of performance capabilities that we can process content and the data in a satisfactory way. And what these companies, Amazon, Microsoft, uh, Google have done, they have commoditized and made it so easy to use those algorithms. And so many of them is just a button click on an interface or a mobile app and so on and so forth, that this commoditization combined with access to a large amount of data and the access to all of these compute capabilities has resulted in a wave, which is making it much, much likely to be happening right now. Another popular thing which happened in 2016 was AlphaGo beats Lee Sedan, the champion in the Go games. And it is considered to be more sophisticated or multiple permutations in combination, even to chess. So it's almost took several years to really get to that level. And it's a progress how machines have been going on and continuing to progress. Where do we go from here? There is one hypothesis or thought process. There is a term called singularity. If you have not heard about it, there is a whole group and a cult which has been talking about singularity in 2045. What it means, as the computing revolution is happening, we started with agricultural revolution, industrial revolution, and so on and so forth. If you notice, the time between each of these phases has drastically decreased from 8,000 years to all the way 9,000 years where human genome was sequenced. So that pace has been continuously increasing, and machines are becoming more and more capable 
to have capabilities similar to a mouse brain, to a human brain, and eventually, maybe in 40, 2045, that's the hypothesis by the Singularity Group, which meets in Vegas every year and has a conference, and there's a lot of investment and buzz around that, that machines and human beings will coexist, and machine, human beings uh, might even become immortal, and several of these kind of concepts which have been brought together. It's something to see. What's happening now? It's not that it's not uh, already happening in certain ways. Uh, I think AI is already happening. This third wave is definitely the most promising so far. And we have achieved quite a lot of things already. And I would say there are certain things like the Roombas of the world, cleaning our houses and uh, vacuuming for us. There is Nest who is controlling the temperatures. The Alexas asks, answering our specific questions, playing music and several other things for us. These kind of things are already available as you use it. This is AI in action. This is what we call as the narrow AI. Very specific things being solved, a particular task being capable, almost like human done by machines. But now what the next frontier is about general AI, trying to do very generic and complicated things, which include driverless cars, even thinking about human beings who can uh, be mimicked by a robot citizen. This is Sophia who in UAE, who has been given the first citizen, robot citizen status in that country. And even going to the extent, Elon Musk has created or uh, built this company, actually acquired a company and formed this neural links. His concept is to really embed some kind of computing capabilities and enhance uh, human capabilities. And it's kind of debatable. We can take in QA if people wanted, um, Elon Musk and several people have cited the threats of AI. But at the same time, they invest in this thing as the only chance for human beings to defend uh, against machine if their machines were to revolt or do some other thing. So that's the concept of neural links. So we have done what is called as the narrow AI, specific purpose things, but we are trying to get into the general AI and trying to do much more sophisticated things ahead. I'm going to talk about a few different industry cases, but I'm going to go faster in this part of the section because uh, there, many of, there are many, many of them, uh, but I want to spend more time in defining what we can do rather than what's already happened. But we do need to understand where the industry is already using and what kind of patterns. I already gave a few of them. Let's talk a few more. Customer interaction. Uh, more and more customer interaction is being taken over by chatbots. You see written formats, you see voice enabled interactions, whether it is Alexa's, the Google Homes and series of the world. Uh, more of that adaptability, especially the new generation, is picking up very fast. And there's no need of a human sitting and answering those questions. And not only uh, it, it's been taken by a machine, but it's very efficient to a certain degree. Of course, there are certain questions those machines and are not able to answer, but 80%, 90%, they are accurate and getting better every day. E-commerce usage. Alibaba, Amazon, and several companies use uh, these kind of applications. They have big data, and that data is the key to success of these things. And that's what Google and Amazon and these companies want to have as much as amount of data. Uh, for example, if you think about Alexa as a device, it's quite cheap. The reason it is cheap and Amazons and these companies want you to have such a device so that they can get access to the data, which is the, um, the main ingredient for the success in building out these applications going forward. We know Amazon uses an army of robots to do a lot of work in their systems. There are videos behind it. Uh, I'm not going to run those videos. I'm going to move forward uh, talking about different applications. Healthcare. There are several innovations happening in the healthcare space. Uh, this is Dr. Molly, which is a virtual uh, capable device based a kind of a doctor or a nurse, if you were to think, and to check the regular basic temperature and the things for senior citizens and people who cannot regularly go to a doctor, check some vitals and so on and so forth uh, to help out the already challenged and uh, limited amount of healthcare professionals which we have uh, as the population is changing. Again, not running those. Uh, again, on the healthcare side, diabetes and several other things have been diagnosed by uh, looking at the retina and the changes over the images from that. Uh, so more and more changes are happening in these spaces. Uh, Uber and Lyft have successfully pioneered how to do ride share and ride applications using machine learning. They check the demand and supply and based on that the pricing is defined. They try to optimize the routes, uh, how we go. 
the rush hour pool time. All these all things are defined by machine learning and looking at the data which they have from the systems are necessary to that. Machine learning is not only just getting into the low end jobs, but transforming high end jobs, like as you saw the medicine science, the law practitioners and legal sector. Uh, JP Morgan has created a system which can check thousands and thousands of contract papers and find anomaly and challenges, if anything. And it does in hours what a lawyer, as you, as you can understand how expensive a lawyer could be, and thousands of hours of time which is spent, there are some specific statistics in an hour, it can do so much. So imagine that time saving and those kind of transformations, which the companies are leveraging because of this. One of the most talked about is driverless cars. Uh, the, whether it is cars, whether it is trucks, which is, I think it's a big change when truck drivers, the highest number of jobs in California for specific you is truck drivers. That's the first line of attack from machines. It is something which is going to be taken over by machines in a few years. It's already systems which are able to run that and it's very straight roads in California and hours and hours of uh, driving which can be easily done by trucks and machines. Uh, the challenge is not the job of the truck drivers only, but think about what happens during the way. A truck driver would take a pit stop, have some tea, uh, take some stops at different spots, buy something, do several things. Uh, that's not what machines are look, going to look forward. They might hop over at some place, charge themselves and move on. So these businesses which are relying on that driver to stop and make those arrangements besides the freeways are also going to be impacted. So quite an impact. Uh, we are of course hearing about drones coming in and delivering things uh, that in, impacts the delivery and the uh, another sector hold together which is, can be impacted from that. So there's quite a lot of impact if you think and it's not in one particular sector. It goes across the board, whether you look at this slide and see legal to manufacturing, marketing, sales. So it's all across the board and companies would like to take that advantage uh, and the economics uh, skill which can machines can provide them. Now, what's in general happening in this industry and what are machines doing? In my humble view, what machines are doing slowly but steadily, they are capturing senses. So AI is machines with senses. For example, we human beings have eye and we can see and similarly machines have built a sophisticated capability to see through computer vision. For example, face detection, image detection, uh, your uh, iPhone can be unlocked by using just your face. All of that is the capability of the sense of our vision which machines have pioneered. They have also captured and successfully adopted the ability to for language and speech. The Alexa is the world if you think about that way. There is translation which can happen very successfully from one language to another. So it's even better than what human, several humans can do. Uh, text to speech and from vice versa is also a capability which machines have pioneered. So slowly but steadily they are getting one vision on sense after the other. What they have definitely much more powerful than us is memory. Human beings have very limited memories compared to what machines can really get and the knowledge base they can really search in seconds. Uh, think about Google, if you write just three letters, uh, Google almost knows what you're thinking about and what you're trying to search already. So that's kind of uh, interesting at the same time, a little creepy in certain ways. So they know so much of data and information, they can find that about us. So that's another strength which machines have. And then they are able to do search in a very sophisticated, fast way and then build several, several applications which could be driving these things. So quite a lot of change in the industry which is happening and it's across the board. It's several sections we see coming all over us from different directions. Now, is it that an end for us and where we see us flowing from there? So I do want to give some inputs. How can we get ready and what can we do about it? So let's take the rest half time which we have left to focus on this part because that's where uh, the action which we can take and what we can understand and adapt and improve ourselves from here. So first and foremost, you like it or not, you cannot ignore machines. It's going to slowly but steadily happen. And because of all the capabilities which machines have, if you think about it, a human being spends half the time in the day doing chores and sleeping and hygiene and other kind of activities which are not needed by machines. 
They can work 24 by seven almost without any hike request, without stopping. Of course, there could be maintenance and those things wide, but that's going to definitely change how companies look at it. And there's no doubt whether companies would be interested to go that route because if they do not, even thinking human aspect, some companies do not, their competitors are going to do and reduce the price accordingly, prices for their services and goods. And other companies will be forced to either change, adopt that model or be extinct. And that's what economy of scales happens. So we cannot ignore that. It's not a question of whether we have it, machines are coming or not. We need to be prepared to live in harmony with machines. Here is a nice little pictorial applying for jobs and a machine is sitting there and you have to start thinking from not only that you're competing with some human fellow humans, but you are competing with a thing and there is a whole change of job accomplice which is happening. And this is something to be concerned about. And every time when this change happens, um, this is said, like new jobs will be created and people will adapt and everything. It is true. There are new jobs which will be created, but the change pace has been drastic. There is drastic change which has uh, happened in a very short period of time, which is, makes it a very tricky balance whether everybody will be able to transition to this new job or something. But what we can do is understand where machines and humans thrive. What are the strengths of machines versus the strengths of us as humans, when men and women, and what we can do about it. And, but we need to be prepared and reskill and think from that perspective. So I do want to share some insights from that perspective. So let's start with comparing the strengths of a machine versus us as human beings. First, what are machines good at? The artificial intelligence is superior in speed. By no means a human being can answer the computing capabilities and the, it, the answer complicated solutions or quizzes or whatever that may be. As I mentioned, they are performing continuous operation without taking a break and intervention. So that's definitely, these are two great strengths which machines have over us. The next one is debatable. They're less biased. It depends on the data which we provide. If you provide enough number of examples, enough number of exceptions and all different kinds of use cases, you have got most of the situations handled. It could be less biased versus a human being can be, let's take a job interview and you think about a person you're looking and feeling and there is some bias which human beings introduce. Machines could avoid several of those, but they have their own biases depending on what the data you get. So this is not necessarily a complete winner on the machine side, but it's balanced, but you could reach that less biased solution from their side. Accuracy, uh, again, it's a strength which machines have much, much more than what humans can have. Now that's not the end of it. So let's compare what we have. Uh, the natural intelligence as a human being, what we have, we can generalize knowledge. We can look at different data points and connect those dots in certain ways, which machines would not be able to do, at least in a short duration of time. It would probably take quite some time for them to reach. Uh, multitasking, this is again kind of debatable. There are machines which are playing uh, table tennis and doing different kinds of sophisticated things and winning very successfully, uh, even multitasking on several different interactions and they can do several things. But right now the progress is slow. Our strength is context, applying context to the situation, getting into the background and understanding where the person is coming in from, understanding the voice, the enthusiasm, the facials and several things. And these are slowly being built into machines, but they're far, far away in from the reach of machines at this point of time. Uh, we can perform complex uh, movements and adapt ourselves to changes, what's happening quickly, which machines may not be able to do. And the most important, the final one is the most important, the human touch. This is an area which we can clearly see a winner for the human beings to really be able to thrive in this kind of situation where they provide the human touch. It is the challenge which I think machines are going to be, I don't want to say never, uh, but would take quite some time to really to reach that point of time. So these are quick comparisons where between human intelligence versus the artificial intelligence, now here is a quick example. We, or even a five-year-old kid can quickly say, this is a picture of a hand painted like zebra. But if you give it to machines, they are going to tell you with a very, very high level of confidence that this is a zebra. Why? It's a very challenging task for a machine to be able to understand and see this and see it as a zebra or a hand. 
it will go to ear towards the side of a zebra because they have never seen large number of images with this kind of a thing, which is, this is an exception. What they see with the stripes and this eyes and this kind of image, uh, where they have mostly seen is zebra. If you provide enough number of this hand painted kind of examples, maybe they will be able to do it. But that's an exception. And again, I want to cite out like human beings are so good at that. And we are able to identify this difference and get the edge over machines. So there are a lot of areas we still have an edge and we'll continue to do for decades before machines can really take over those sections. Now I want to break this impact into three different sections. There are three sections we have to understand. An area where there is high impact, which eventually mostly would be done by machines and less to nothing intervention from human beings, right? Uh, there is an area where both we have to live in harmony, we have to perform together where machines are doing certain parts and human beings are doing certain parts of the work where machines cannot and it will take too much of uh, investment to really make machines capable of that. So that could be a combination of those. Now, again, the last part is low impact. Again, I would not want to say never, but machines could take quite some time to reach to this level of areas which will not be impacted. Now, what are those? Let's take a few look at that. Areas mostly impacted, uh, food services, uh, manufacturing parts of it. There are certain parts which are complex and could not be uh, conveyor belt and simple things. It's putting time to do that. You already have seen, I'm sure, seen examples and videos and images of how machines are able to do that. Banking systems, you'll see, definitely see ATMs and other kinds of systems which are answering and taking over less and less uh, employees in the branch. Uh, retail stores, you can self-service yourself and several of those examples are present and more of those examples are going to be. These are just a small list of what could potentially go away very quickly. Now, areas less likely to be automated, healthcare workers, teachers, anything to do with creative work, social work, counseling, uh, supervising, lawyers, uh, several areas, and you start seeing a theme in there. If you wanted to look at them closely, you'll start noticing a theme out there. And that's, this is a theme that is in the broad sense, I only see two options to save ourselves and the future generation from jobs. And this could be yourself, your kids and how you look at it. There are only two choices. One, be more human and be all those jobs which are counseling, supervising, healthcare, taking care of people around you, understanding the empathy and sort of these emotions, which we are much, much more better than what you machines can do and get those areas sophisticated or get tech savvy, right? And just want to dwell on that for a few seconds and give you a chance to really sink that in. And the previous slide was almost trying to say, highlight that these are more human kind of a job where you have to understand the uh, emotions, the reactions, the understanding of facials and how you deal with those complex conversations and motivate people and several of those kind of jobs which are, are in the human side of it or the other choice is to get more and more tech savvy. Being a conversation of a techie festival, I would focus and just give some more pointers on the techie side and uh, let you all think about the human aspect of it where you can and think about those jobs. Now, if you want to look at the tech side of the world, uh, there are quite a few options uh, which somebody can look and some of you may be able to adapt or think in this direction, especially guide the next generation to look at that. I want to focus on how machines work and if somebody is aspiring to become a data scientist or a more tech person, what they can look at it. So this is a very popular Wayne diagram, which I re always request people to take it as, an, as a self-reflection. If you are like many other people who are thinking about becoming a data scientist, you have to really look at that and self-reflect and see where my next action, action items to be, become a data scientist. You need three, and actually a few more, but the three core skills to become a data scientist. Number one, you should have decent amount of math and statistic capabilities. This is reducing as more and more commoditization is happening in the industry. You need to have domain expertise with whatever your sector may be, whether it is healthcare, finance, and whatever sector you're working on. And finally, you need to have some kind of programming skills. Now, this could be one person, and that person could be a sophisticated and high paying job of a data scientist. It takes a while. It's a journey which I advise people do not try to think you will just be getting this, all these skills in a few days, depending on where you are starting, or weeks even, months even. It could be years. Uh, but if that's what you 
aspire to do, you can slowly steadily start building on it. Or it could be a team where somebody knows the math and the domain and you get a computer programmer who is really capable of that and team up together to become a data science team. Uh, and people who have domain expertise uh, is a very, very valuable asset uh, in that sector. It's changing, evolving, but there's quite a lot of domain expertise uh, value still in the system. And I'm if you start- Giving you a four minute warning. Okay, thank you. You're almost there. Uh, and uh, combining these things give you certain kind of capabilities. If you notice having a mathematics stick skills and having the computer programming and coding skills give you becomes a machine learning person, but it's not a data scientist. A data scientist needs a domain expertise as well, because you have to really look in the scenarios and think about, oh, am I applying in the sense of true data or uh, domain expertise as well? What's the data telling me? What's the world telling me? The domain telling me? rather than just what is the, the mathematical side of it. Math can be sometimes misleading. The numbers could be misleading in certain ways, or it can be drawn to a, a one-sided conversation or conclusion. And so you have to be mindful about that. And you can look into this interesting vein diagram and you could decide I'm going to just be programmer uh, and just start building my skills in the programming side. I could become uh, somebody who is focusing in the domain. So I would give you a thought uh, process and this vein diagram as a point tool to do a self-reflection and build onto it. Positive things. There are a lot of interesting, fun things happening, whether, whether it is changing a black and white image to color or providing the capabilities for differently able people to drive or reach from one place to another, even blind people being able to really get to uh, places without assistance from others and so on and so forth. It's interesting options which are come opening up. Uh, situations in nuclear reactors or fire hazard or completely dangerous places where machines could be the first line of defense and help our firefighters and others. And of course, in medical science and so on. There is a lot of positive use cases and patterns which are coming in the industry. So it's not necessarily what I would say, a thing to be uh, only worried about. Yes, there is concerns and things which you have to look out and there are a few options which we wanted to share today. So with that, I bring to the end uh, of the session plus part of it and open up for question answers. Thank you very much. And I'm going to go back one slide and keep it there. Or, or Don, if you have any questions, we can take that at this moment of time. Thank you very much, Roger. We do have a number of questions that came in and we have uh, next 11 minutes to answer those questions. And so let's start off with the first question uh, from Heidi, which is what is the tech industry doing to help people affected by the job loss apocalypse? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's a challenging uh, question. So this is not necessarily, I would say, a technology change only, but there is a societal impact which you have to think about whether these people who are transitioning from being a truck driver right now, can they become uh, completely revolutionized to become a data scientist? Many may not, just we have to face the truth. Uh, it would be a challenge and wave. Industry is doing certain parts of it, but there is no... Uh, full on approach to really transform this part. I think uh, there are several boot camps and training programs and uh, in universities opening up MOOCs for people around the world and being able to adapt and do these things. But there is no one specific uh, solution or the mass scale uh, or universal scale at this point of time. Great, thank you. Uh, next question is, what happens to people who cannot both afford to live and quote unquote reskill? Education is very expensive in the country. Yeah, um, I think I think it's education is getting expensive. There are lots of things, but if you wanted uh, to really, really determine to really learn yourself something, uh, it's an interesting age with the internet and a machine. That that's what you need. If you're really determined, it's not a challenge of information. I can definitely guarantee that any kind of education information is available on the net, on YouTube, other channels, and from and there are companies who have been really nice to really share up and to give uh, in Stanford included, open up their lot of great sessions. The challenge is not information, it's information overload. How to really distill that information to what you get. But if somebody's really determined, information is not a challenge. It's the focus and what you, which, which itself is, could be challenging with all the things going on. But I think if you want to determine, you can find ways. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question. Uh, what is the intersection between AI and knowledge repositories, such as ServiceNow? Yeah, uh, a lot of applications have been built on the repository. I even had a slide talking back to that, 
And AI, if you think about it, it has those senses, which I talked about, but it also has this repository. When you call Alexa and ask for a music, it looks something like a CDN from their side, a network of delivery content which they have, and they look back on those contents and reflect. And the more and more Amazons and the Googles of the world looking at internet, looking at the music services, looking at different actions, looking at services like ServiceNow or just getting a context for a particular uh, card or just specific con con currency conversion. So they are getting this access to this huge, huge amount of repository, ServiceNow being one of them and uh, which you can access and really get uh, applications built on the existing set of data. So more and more that is happening already. Okay, there was a question from uh, Lillian about going back one slide from options. And Lillian, if you, um, let's see here. Uh, I've moved too fast. Lillian, if you have a follow-up question to that, just let us know. We want to make sure that you're able to see here. Okay, so I guess it was a jobs, uh, the one slide, back one slide from options. So the previous slide. Yeah. Okay. And if you do have a follow-up question, Lillian, please let us know uh, by typing it into the Q&A. Uh, next question I have is, this is a long one. It's, uh, it seems like much of the lower skilled work is going to go to AI in the future, which means there will be more poverty from the lower skilled workers who cannot afford college and training to reskill. Also, there will be more competition for the reskilled positions. Why is there such a major push for the AI agenda when it means that less people will be working and less money will be used to sustain the economy. This cannot be a good thing. Yeah, yeah. No, I, first of all, I want to clarify that is uh, the initial thinking the industry and the in, um, AI sector had, like it is a low skilled job, but actually that's shifting very fast. And I have put lawyers, for example, over here, uh, all you know, very, lawyers are very expensive. Uh, doctors and healthcare, not complete everything about it. There was a nice little video which I saw a few days back and what can be taken. Uh, it's not the completely doctor will be eliminated at this point of time, but there's quite a lot of help which that middle area of where humans and uh, machines work together. The high-end jobs is what AI has shifted its focus because the ROI is much higher. If you can eliminate thousands of hours of work for a lawyer, I think it's not the low end, it is across the board, but yes, the low end has a lot of scale and all the uh, Starbucks and different kinds of uh, these kind of outlets being able to do that uh, is definitely being impacted. It's a very debatable topic and there are much more ethics, the social impact, and there's a whole area which has to be dwelt and talk, talked about. Um, in interesting, we did not dwell into that too much of that. Microsoft and uh, Bill Gates Foundation and several people have started thinking on those lines. Uh, it's an uncharted territory. It's not that technology cannot take over and build at this point of time, all these technologies. It's more of the social challenge. Uh, can we have a rudimentary driving driverless cars today? Yes, but it's not socially and safety wise correct right now. Uh, and that's the challenge uh, or the, the work is moving towards the, that direction more so than the technology. Technology is capable quite a bit at this point already, uh, but we do as a society have to address all of those other sites to be done. It's work in progress. Thank Good you. Question, That's, big one. Yeah. Sorry about that. Uh, thank you. There was one comment before we get to the next question and a comment that came up and actually there's another question that came in from Jerry, uh, but a question came up earlier when you're talking about the differences between AI and humans is a human has creativity and criticism. We can say something that doesn't make sense or we uh -huh. can tell when something does not make sense. So thank you very much, Mikhail, for that comment. Um, two other questions that came up uh, from uh, Mark. If manufacturing jobs are moved back to the USA, how much will AI help with manufacturing? Can people be trained to fix AI in the factories? Um, interestingly enough, I have a close contact and person who is really looking into revolutionized manufacturing and using AI and this whole revolution, which is not touched in manufacturing to a certain extent. It could be. Uh, the world is going to change quite drastically and it is changing with all the changes right now happening most things are moving to online and you we never imagined certain things can be done online which are happening uh, there is a company called bright machines it's trying to really revolutionize how manufacturing is done and completely change into manufacturing side of it especially with a, a scale it has been portions have been done but it's being looked at it will be interesting times to see how that changes the equation. And I think, I do believe that the world is going to transform quite a bit 
thinking about the dependency of oil and certain things like this are going to change the dynamics of the whole world trajectory where the interest and focus can everything and the power of countries when the which have a lot of data capabilities and ai capabilities are really going to be the next frontier of battle uh, for power at this point of time rather than oil and few other things which have been in the past okay one question that came up um jay i'm going to skip your first question go to your second one was what was the name of the company you mentioned bright machines okay and then jerry's question was how is ai being integrated in the education yeah um there are quite a few initiatives which are happening if you look as as simple as khan academy uh, which is a very popular name and i think hopefully everybody knows that's why i take that example is it's not trying to teach you everybody at the same level right in the school as uh, are uh, what i say is the best possible compromise in my mind i'm, I'm very passionate about education and i think uh, i've thought a lot about that uh, the best form of education or best effective way for an individual would be to one on one somebody is teaching them guiding them to gather in their need level very expensive to the very extent like one fit all and everybody is being taught the same thing right and the cost of somebody who is way ahead and somebody is way behind the uh, which is always the case in a group uh somewhere in the middle will be there and ai is helping sir to certain extent if you take khan academy and you start a kid who is trying to do 2 plus 2 and math and they keep on excelling that number it just jumps you up it doesn't make you go through all the 10 questions it sees you are already competent to that and move you to the next level and next level and brings you slowly but um, very quick uh, they can find where your strengths are and start giving you information to that so ai is definitely changing the landscape of education and providing access to people across the world which was definitely not available few decades back and that's changing the dynamics of the world at this point of time and it would continue to change that so uh, i education is dear and near to my heart and the world is going to be transformed hopefully more positively than negative because of that impact great thank you very much uh, there's one more actually one comment and one more uh, regarding your slides is can you go back to the slide which shows the jobs that would be most impacted by ai okay yeah and then let us know if you have any other follow up questions this is 1209 so we have about one more minute before we get prepped for our next session uh but there was one comment from Messeries where Khan Academy or saying Khan Academy was beyond helpful when i taught math to a wide range of levels of kids in one grade a very welcome ai addition to education yeah yeah it it has transformed and continues to build a lot of education videos and not only math it is added to the thing i think we need more and more of those kind of industry education is which empowers everybody just in changes the differences between anybody and brings the strength i think that's why i believe education is the number one sector which anybody any company any industry any country has to focus first to build their next generation great thank you very much uh, raju for taking time to answer the questions and thank you very much for your presentation as well today thank you everyone and have good rest of the day thank you and hope you have continued a lot of great sessions thanks for those great uh, questions um, have a great day